people say that, then they'll know something happened. In the meantime. Should have come to class. Should have come to class. <laughs> Missing all the good jokes. Okay, so let's, before we start, I'm going to try it. So, A, have you heard of Lambda Calculus before? Yes. yes. No's and yeses. Okay. Quick question. Yeah, I'm saying, I'm recording. No, is this the PowerPoint's online? No, not yet. Okay, please. I didn't know if I'd get to it today or not, but I'm making good progress. Okay. So, let's try to. We're going to come at this with a completely fresh, new, different mindset, right? So let's not bring in baggage of like, oh my god, calculus and college, like there's no integrals, something like that. It just describes a way of performing computation, right? So then the lambda is the character that we're going to use. So actually this is great. You only need to ever use with this one Greek symbol, and that's lambda. And it's actually really easy to draw too, right? Yeah, which is a super awesome benefit. Okay. <laughs> also, before we start, I should be very clear. Uh, we're actually going to go into some pretty cool, like, formal stuff. So we're going to, so um, you've studied <coughs> Turing machines, right? So why do we study Turing machines? Do you program on a Turing machine? Yeah? yeah? Yes. You program a Turing machine? Oh, I thought you said yes. I love oh. Anybody program on a Turing machine? No, why do we study Turing machines? Because we tell you to as professors? That's what you're supposed to say. But why do we do that? They're just as powerful and expressive as the algorithms that we're studying at the theoretical level. Yeah, right? So a Turing machine is great because it allows us to think about computation without worrying about a machine, right? And incredibly smart people have showed actually that awesome HP laptop that you have or your iPhone still can't fundamentally can't do anything more than a Turing machine. It just does it quicker. It does it quicker and it actually exists. Those are two big differences, right? <laughs> Turing machine has infinite tape and inf like infinite memory, right? Which doesn't exist in any system ever yet. Uh, Good. Right? So it helps us think about what types of things can we compute, right? We know if we can do it for a Turing machine, then we can write a program to do it, right? Um, and so that helps us think about what is possible, right? This is actually getting more into the computer science of computer science, right? Um, that's like there's the famous quote that computer science is um, about computers like astronomy is about telescopes, right? So we're actually th talking about computation more abstractly than the computer or programming, right? Uh, we program to instantiate that and to get the computers and the machines to actually do something, right? But that's not necessary. So, why I want to talk about that is lambda calculus is a different way of thinking about computations. So it's actually, people have shown that you can express a Turing machine with lambda calculus, and you can express lambda calculus with a Turing machine. So it's, um, in that sense, it is just as expressive, right? So anything you can do with lambda calculus, you can do with a Turing machine, you can do with your computer. And I'll actually make an argument as we go into this that actually lambda calculus is a lot closer to some family of programming languages, right? So if you can understand kind of how lambda calculus works, it's actually going to help you. It's actually much more applicable. Like nobody writes programs where you talk about like, read in one and like move the tape right or left, right? But here we talk about function applications and defining functions and uh, invoking functions, calling functions, and we have functions returning functions, right? Which is kind of what you're doing in homework four. But also, even the syntax is actually very similar to Lisp and the Lisp and Scheme family of languages. That's actually because they're derived kind of from here, but it's actually a real programming language that you can do a lot of really cool stuff in. Okay, questions before we get started? All right. So the other really cool thing that I like about it is that, like I said, Turing machine, right, is like read something and move left or right and read or write something else, right? Those are the fundamental operations. But that really, what, what applicability does that have to you in your life as a programmer? Nothing. Almost nothing, right? I mean, you're just, you don't write programs that write zero or one and move in a direction, right? That doesn't really make sense. What do you use most often, well, oh God. what do you hopefully use as a good software engineering technique most often? 
What was that? A debugger? Okay. But like, how do you construct your programs? With your fingers typing, yes. <laughs> also that, huh? Incremental, yeah, you incrementally develop it. You just have it in like one thing that was like do all this stuff. Probably. Yes? You're gonna have trouble. Functionally? Yeah, or functionally or object, right? You separate your you separate some of that functionality and you encapsulate it so that it can be reused, right? And so lambda calculus, when you boil it down. The fundamental structure here is functions and function applications. So in this aspect, it actually does mimic programming very well, right? You can define, can you define functions in a Turing machine? I think I kind of you can, but like not in the language itself, right? The language doesn't really support that, right? I mean, I think you can have your go-to state in your program, right, go somewhere else, yeah. But it's not, it's not, it doesn't feel clean, and it doesn't feel like what you do in your daily programming life, right? You define functions, those functions accept parameters, and they do some computation, and they return some result, right? So this is, and this is the crazy thing, is lambda calculus, the only things you can do are define functions and apply functions. That's it. Those are the only, there's no addition operator, nothing but it is still as expressive as a Turing machine. You can still do every, it's actually kind of crazy, right? Everything you want to do on a computer, any kind of computation, can be done with using functions and applying functions, which is exactly how you think about programming normally. So the key thing is that you have the ability to apply anonymous functions, right? So what does anonymous function mean? A function without a name. A function without a name, yes. It's like a, kind of like the start of a Western. A man with no name walked into a soda place. Uh, right? And so these are the two key things. We can define anonymous functions. We actually can't even give functions names. But we can define anonymous functions. And we can apply those functions. So what did we see that applying functions mean? Project four, or homework four. You, there's like a node that says apply. What does that mean? To use or invoke, right? We can define anonymous functions, and we can invoke those functions. Those are the only things we can do. But we can still do everything possible that you can do in any programming language. And so ML, Haskell, F Sharp, Clojure, there's a lot of kind of functional programming, and also the Lisp family of languages derive and get a lot of inspiration from Lambda Calculus. Is Lisp another one of those? Yes. Lisp actually follows almost directly, as we'll see. So if you've ever done any Lisp or Scheme programming, the syntax is actually exactly the same here with Lambda Calculus. We have parentheses that we use to delineate our structures, but we're not there yet. We're still building up. OK, so some history. Oh, I should also, did I already say this? I don't think I said it yet. Um, so I'm not, I don't have a crazy strong theoretical background. I'm a hacker, really fundamentally. Um, this is why some of your cries for me to teach 355 or something go un unanswered. unanswered, because that is not, I don't have that formal mathematical background. But I still really, I, yes, uh, I still really like lambda calculus, even though we're going to talk about it really formally because it is very intuitive and it has very clear relations to programming languages. And I think it's going to help you think about uh, languages and how you program. I think it's going to help you think about it differently. Uh, but with all that said, so, you know, if you see something that's wrong or you think is incorrect, like, <coughs> ask me. And I'll try to, we'll try to answer it. Okay, so actually the study, this is actually kind of crazy. So back in 19, uh, sorry, 1893, uh, I'm gonna butcher all these names. You said you did German, can you, Frege? Frege? I think it's a German name. Frege? 
That sounds French, but. No, it was more French. Anyways, <laughs> he first studied the use of functions in logic. So they were trying to understand logic, right? So you've, I believe you've taken classes on logic, right? First order logic, Boolean logic, right? Um, and so he was interested in trying to study, well, how do we, what do functions mean in logic? How can we use that there? Um, then in the 20s, uh, I can pronounce that one. Yeah, Schumfinkel. Uh, in the 1920s, he studied how combinators, which are kind of what we're going to get to, are a very specific type of function and how those can be applied to formal logic. And they started to see that, like, wow, actually this logic, like ands, ors, can actually be applied and used using functions, which seems kind of crazy, right? Why would there be a relation between? So what's a mathematical function? OK, that is an example of a mathematical function, yes. But what does a function like mean in uh, a set of ordered pairs? But yeah, so I like to think of it as a mapping, right? So you have, and you can think about it as ordered pairs, right? Maps one thing to another thing. If you have more tuples or whatever, then you're mapping some of the input to some of the output, right? So all a function does is map things, right? And they started to see that, like, actually, with this mapping, you can actually do logic, and you can do first-order logic and all kinds of logic. Um, Church in 1930, so Alfonso Church introduced lambda calculus, and Unfortunately, this is what happens sometimes when you do things with research. Uh, Clean, who remembers Clean? Or is it Cleaning? I actually can't remember. It was Cleaning? Yeah. He did the Cleaning Star, right, from regular expressions. Uh, so Cleaning and Rosser, they showed that actually the original lambda calculus was logically inconsistent, which kind of sucks <laughs> if you spent your whole time developing this calculus that I'm going to show you. So then in 1936, he, Church revised it and published Lambda Calculus, and that's kind of when it was first uh, relevant to computation. And it's been even refined further. So people have added type systems and done all kinds of additions to Lambda Calculus. And even, as we'll see, this kind of turned into some modern-ish programming <coughs> languages like with Lisp. So the ideas kind of stem from here. OK, so we're going to treat this like we're learning a new programming language. That's essentially what we're doing, right? So what do we need to know to learn a new programming language? How it works. What does that mean? How it's defined, how it's structured. How it's we need syntax, which defines what a valid program looks like, and what else? Simple commands. What was semantics. it? Semantics. Yeah, we need the semantics, right? which goes over all those things that everyone was saying, right? We need to understand how to write a valid program in this language, and which is the syntax, right? And which now you all know how to write a parser to validate the syntax against a grammar. And we also need to know the semantics. What does it actually mean? What does, when I say it defines an anonymous function, what does that actually mean? Question. Yes? Question. Oh, 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 I thought that was, you had a question. No. Okay. So we're going to start off, our syntax is actually going to be incredibly simple, which is actually one of the benefits of, and I'm going to keep saying, talking about Lisp because I actually really like it a lot, um, but it's actually one of the benefits of a Lisp-like language is that the syntax is incredibly simple, right? It, yes, it's incredible, and that actually has really good metaprogramming capabilities in using Lisp with macros, but that's neither here nor there. Okay, so an expression can either be an ID, right? So this is our base case. An expression can be lambda ID dot expression. That's it. Okay. Or an expression can be expression space expression. And then we want some disambiguation rules, right? So we want to be able to use parentheses to group expressions. So an expression can be any one of these four things. These are the only four things that an expression can be. Right? Do we, does anybody recall this, this, the syntax for like C, how long that is? Mm -hmm. Or the syntax for your project 
five language or project four language, right? It's a lot more complex and involved, but this is all you need. So that's the whole language? This is the entire language, the syntax of the language. That's nice. And it's, <laughs> it's turn complete, it's crazy. This can do any type of computation you want just with this. Okay, so but what do these things mean? Yeah, it doesn't matter yet, right? <laughs> it does not matter yet. We haven't talked about what they mean. We need to make sure that we understand the syntax, just like when we learned regular expressions, right? We need to go over the syntax of regular expressions, and then we get into what do regular expressions mean, right? Okay, so here's our language. So is this uh, an expression in lambda calculus? Sure. Yes. Yes, by rule one. Is this a valid expression in lambda calculus? Sure. Yes. Look how easy the lambda is to do. Right? It's, like really, it's kind of like a crooked H almost. Lowercase h. What was that? Upside down, upside down y. y. Yeah, or an upside down y. That's the other way to think of it. But like, it's a little too. It's flipped 180 for a, for a y. Oh, uh, yeah, and then reversed. Oh, not crazy. Not it's not quite an upside down y. Maybe in a mirror. OK. Is this a lambda expression? A lambda an expression in lambda calculus? Yes. Yes. Is this? Oh, no, no, no. What's missing? What's wrong? You need one too many lambdas. What? You need an ID and a dot after that first one. Right, so we have the first lambda. We need an ID and then a dot, right? So here, this is not a valid lambda expression. There we go. Here we have lambda x dot y z. Yeah, that's fine. Yes. Yeah, so why? So what's the question? So go back to your original question before you answer it. Right. So we have, right, the second rule gives us lambda id dot expression. And we have expression is an expression and an expression. And we have each of those is an id. Right? But is that, well, let's kind of peek forward a little bit. Is that the only way to parse that string? What's the other way? What? You're just going to throw out numbers? I'm not a computer. Right? So it could be that we have lambda id dot, what if this is the expression, right? And so the outer one is expression, expression, right? So basically the question is, is this y associated with this rule, or is that yz associated with this expression, right? Uh, so we'll get into actually how to disambiguate this, but I want you to realize that, yes, this grammar is incredibly simple, but it is also ambiguous. Okay, what about something like this? Uh, how do you have something before the lambda? Yeah. Yes. yes. That's right. So yeah. You tell me. Yes, yes because it could just be expression, expression, okay. and that can be expression. Yeah, so at the top right, rule three says this is expression, and this whole thing is an expression. Right? And then rule two says that this is lambda dot, uh, lambda id dot expression. And we know that this is an expression because of rule four. And then we see we have expression, space expression, right? And then inside here, we know this is an expression because of the parentheses. And then here we have expression and expression, right? Cool. OK. But we have clearly ambiguous syntax, right? So how to parse this, x, y, z? What are the two different ways? x and y, z, or x, y, and z? Yeah, so we have expression goes to expression z. And then expression goes to x, y. Or the other way around. We have expression where x is on the left, and then we have expression where y and z. So those that have looked at um, project 5 bonus project, how does the project 5 bonus project handle this? It does recursive expressions just like this, right? The grammar has recursion, right? So like in project five, normally you can't have an arbitrary long expression, right? You just have something plus something. Right, you can't have something plus something plus something plus something plus something. <coughs> something plus something times something divided by something else. Isn't that the first rule? What first rule? And like, what, 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 what
the first rule that applies to that, and then you continue on, like in the line of how they're given. Like if there's uh, yes, but you need to know how, I need to know which parts to create from this string, right? So like from five plus two times three, I should, by my knowledge of math, right, it should be first five times three because that has higher precedence than the plus, right? But so you either need to specify that specifically, like by having disambiguation rules outside the grammar, or you can change the grammar. So uh, good practice. Look at Project 5 grammar, the bonus of Project 5 grammar. See how that supports it, how that grammar supports it. OK. More examples, right? We saw how to parse this, lambda x dot x, y. Right? We know that this is a valid is valid by the syntax, but we don't know exactly what parse tree to create. Right? One of the examples is we have expression, uh, lambda x expression, and then we have expression x expression y, or expression, expression expression, right, as the first one. And then on the right we have y, and on the other side we have lambda x x. That makes sense? So this is the example we saw. So these are the two different ways to parse that string. Okay, so we're not going to change our syntax rules. We are going to add some disambiguation rules outside the grammar. So these are important. These are going to be something that we all are going to agree on by fiat because I said so, right? So the first one, right, if we have E goes to EE, e, it's going to be left associative. So using parentheses to disambiguate, when we see x, y, z, we know that it's going to first do x, y, and then z. This is how it's going to parse. Now remember, we don't know exactly what it's going to do, right? But we know this is how we're going to parse it. We're first, well, this thing is lower down on the tree, right? x, z, and then y. And so we can extend this with w, x, y, z. This will be what? W, x, y, z. W, so it'll be W, X like this, and then Y, Z? Yes. Is that left, left associative? No, it's W, X, Y, and parentheses. Yeah, so it's going to build it out like this. Right? So that's, left associative just means we always go leftmost, right? And so we do the leftmost here, and we say, oh, it's still ambiguous, right? So we do the leftmost of this one, right? It's the same rules applies over and over. Okay. Now if we have lambda id dot expression so it, so the idea is we're going to extend as far to the right as possible starting with lambda id dot so for instance here x and y are both going to be part of expression right when we write it like this lambda dot xy this means the same thing as lambda x dot parentheses xy Just like when we see this, lambda x dot lambda x dot x, right? This inner one is going to be just x. And the outer one is going to include this expression here. Right? OK. Cool. Let's stop here for now. And on Monday, we're going to get into more examples of these. OK, let's, let's preview something really quickly, because I want to get why this is really important to understand. Um, we need to be able to understand things like this by, just by looking at it. Which was the process? We'll get there when we get there. But this is just something like this, too, right? We need to understand exactly what this does. Syntax, right? It's like a programming language. You have to understand and know how to parse it. So I'll do on Monday, uh, either Monday or Tuesday, I will give, I will do Monday. On Monday, I'll give a, a practice midterm, right? And we'll go over that on Wednesday. So if there's anything on the practice midterm to practice this, then you would assume that there will be something like that on the midterm. It just takes a little bit. It actually, would be, it actually would be really good. This is really good timing because we can get familiar with regular expressions and disambiguation rules first before we get into all this. You don't have to Let's see, where's another really